Hi, and we're live. Uh, I'm Daza Greenwood, uh, scientist at the MIT Media Lab and um, instructor for the upcoming MIT Computational Law course. And this video is an intro uh, to rights expressions languages with Bill Rosenblatt, um, who is um, joining us right now by Hangout. And, uh, and Bill, thanks for taking the time to, uh, to come and, uh, and go through these slides and then also to be available to the students um, at MIT next week. Much obliged. So perhaps you can give a little more background about yourself and then let's dig right in. All right, well, thank you very much, Daza, for inviting me to do this. I'm very excited about the class that you're teaching and um, it's a pleasure to, to be involved with it. Um, as, as you mentioned, my name is Bill Rosenblatt and I am a consultant. I run a consulting firm called Giant Steps Media Technology Strategies. I'll just give you uh, a little bit of my background here. So, Yes, so I have a, uh, a firm, as I said, which I've run since the year 2000. Uh, my background is sort of multifarious. I've been a software engineer. I have been a media industry IT executive. Um, while I was a software engineer, I contributed to the GNU project, the open source project back in the mid 1980s. I worked as a tech uh, a, a market strategist for uh, Sun Microsystems in the publishing and media industry. I have been a book author and editor and a radio producer. And I more specifically wrote a book on digital rights management back in 2001 or so. I run a conference called Copyright and Technology Conference. Uh, and I've spoken at various events worldwide and I've guest lectured at other places. This is my first time at MIT. I've been across the river at the Berkeley College of Music. I've been in Columbia, Carnegie Mellon and a bunch of other places. Um, and I have served as an expert witness in various litigations that have to do with digital media and copyright technology. And I've served as a public policy advisor on digital copyright technology in the US, Europe, and Asia. So um, that's a little bit about me. Essentially, I'm not a lawyer, but I play one on TV sometimes. And what we're gonna talk about today is really at the intersection of tech and law, which is a perfect fit for the course that you are teaching. So I wanna start out by mentioning a book that I'm sure that many people who are taking this class are familiar with, which is Larry Lessig's first, at least his first book for a general audience, Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace, published in 1999, a, a seminal work. And he shows in that book something called, or explains something called the four forces of regulation. Um, which has come to be known as the pathetic dot theory. And the dot is in the middle of this diagram and it represents people who are um, controlled or, or affected by four forces. And the four forces apply regardless of where you are, whether you're online, whether you're in the real world, these are the four forces that regulate your um, activities and your behavior. And they are law, which is just laws as they're written and, and executed. The market, which is the way businesses and economics behave. Architecture, which is technology, physics, things of that nature that are natural phenomena in whatever world you occupy. And then norms, which are behaviors, human behaviors, which are uh, perhaps those that arise out of convention or what people, the way people are expected to behave out of convention. So those are the four forces. And when we're talking about what we're gonna talk about today with rights expression languages, we're really talking about how these forces interrelate in the online world. So the other thing that I think it's important to establish, even though some of you might be familiar with this already, is the basic copyright, the basics of copyright law, and particularly the rights that a creator of a work, such as a piece of music, photograph, sculpture, painting, novel, or what have you, are granted under law. This is what we call sometimes the copyright bundle of rights. And the first of these rights is something that is so fundamental that a lot of people ignore it when they're looking at this stuff. And that's in section 101 of the Copyright Act, it is the fact that copyright 
applies to material objects, which means CDs, DVDs, books, films, etc. It does not apply to digital files independently of the medium on which they are stored. So hold that thought. We're going to come back to it later. Other rights, the ones that are more typically discussed when we talk about the basics of copyright law, are the rights of, in the second bullet point, reproduction, distribution, creation of derivative works, public display, and public performance. So reproduction simply means making copies. Distribution simply means sending or giving uh, your work to somebody else. Derivative works are things like film adaptations of novels or uh, edited versions of photos or um, thing, any, anything that you do to make something else out of a work that still has some characteristics of that work is called a derivative work. Public display, public performance, pretty self-explanatory. And then there are certain types of visual works such as paintings and sculptures that have additional rights under copyright law, such as the right to be attributed properly to the creator of the work and the right for the author of the work to prevent harm to his or her reputation by damage or mutilation of the work. That's something known as a moral right. And there is a limited set of moral rights in US law. And by the way, I should mention, all of this is US specific. If you are in another country, your mileage may vary, although some of the concepts may uh, translate to, to other copyright laws. There is also something called the first sale doctrine, which is more typically uh, described as a limitation on rights. And that is when you, if you're the, the owner of a copyrighted work and you give it to somebody else, you sell it to them, you give it to them, you lend it to them, well, mainly you actually let's express it differently. If you obtain a copyrighted work lawfully, you buy it, someone gives it to you, what have you, then you can do whatever you want with it without any control from the entity that gave it to you. So the, the most typical example of this, you buy a book, you can resell that book, you can give the book away, you can use it as a doorstop. You buy a CD, you can resell it, lend it, give it away, use it as a Christmas tree ornament. Um, this applies to most types of physical content except certain types of software, and we won't get into the minutia of that. But that's an important thing to recognize that if you if you have a, a copyrighted work, then you have the right to dispose of it as you see fit. Okay, so now let's talk about, we've talked about the exclusive rights that a creator has to his or her work. Now let's talk about what uh, others can do with works under copyright law. So if you get a copyrighted work, you can use it yourself. That's the normal case. You can also license rights from the copyright owner in addition to the rights that you already have, and you do that by contract. Then there is something called fair use, which is something that people have discussed for hours and days and months and years. We're going to just talk about it very generally. Section 107 of the copyright law. Uh, fair use is really a defense to an allegation of infringement. If I claim that you've infringed my copyright, you can, in a court proceeding, say, no, I've made a fair use of it, and here's why I think I've made a fair use of it. This is something that a court decides, and it's based on a number of factors that are codified in the law. It's also based on a number of um, ideas that have come up through case law history, such as this idea of transformative use. If you transform the content in some way, then it may be a fair use of that content. So um, that, again, a, a lot can be said about that. The one thing that I want to make sure we understand here is that fair use is not something that can be decided by an automated process or a machine. It's something that a court gets to decide. And um, in the footnotes, you'll see a quote from a seminal law review article that was written um, in, I believe, 1989. Uh, by Pierre Laval, who is a federal judge, now a, an appeals court judge. And the money quote from that article is, we should not adopt a bright line standard for fair use unless it were a good one, and we do not have a good one. And that is essentially the reason why there is no dis machine decidable fair use. So let's keep that in mind as we go on as well. 
So we're here to talk about rights expression languages. These are machine readable rights descriptions. And the purpose of them is to make rights and licenses understandable and actionable at internet speed as opposed to human speed and avoid something that I call the trap door into the legal system. Um, you don't need to hire a lawyer. You don't need someone to interpret and explain something to you. You can just act on a description of rights by automated process. So the more specific goals of rights expression languages are generally twofold. These are overlapping but distinct goals. The first goal is to enforce rights, and this first in chronological order of how these things were designed, to enforce rights in a technological scheme for enforcing rights. And then the second goal is to automate licensing processes to just conveniently and efficiently automate the process of licensing rights. So we're gonna talk about both of these things. We're gonna start, start by talking about uh, RELs or rights expression languages for rights enforcement. And this of course means a DRM mechanism, digital rights management. This is something that came into being in roughly the mid 1990s and one of the handful of pioneers in this field and the one who specifically pioneered the use of rights expression languages for DRM systems was a researcher at Xerox PARC named Mark Stefik. Stefik is uh, a researcher who had an AI background um, from Stanford before he went uh, down the peninsula, as it were, or maybe it's up, I can't remember, to, to Xerox PARC. And he wrote a paper called Letting Loose the Light, Igniting Commerce in Electronic Publication. And in 1995, he and some colleagues from Xerox walked into my office when I was working in the publishing industry and gave me a copy of this paper, which I thought was fascinating. The paper was subsequently published as a chapter in Stefik's book, Internet Dreams, Archetypes, Myths, and Metaphors, that was published in 1996 by the home team by MIT Press. And it contains chapters by a bunch of different authors. It's a very interesting book about um, concepts and ideas around the early days of the internet. And he also took out a patent on uh, this subject area, one of several patents that he took out on DRM systems. This one, what we call the 403 patent, which actually expired uh, recently, is for system for controlling the distribution and use of digital works having attached usage rights where the usage rights are defined by a usage rights grammar. And this has been uh, claimed at least to, uh, uh, to mean a DRM system that uses a rights expression language. There has been uh, licensing, there's been litigation over this, and that is what the claims are said to, to read on. I'm not expressing an opinion on that, I'm just saying what has been said to, to have been uh, the case in, in litigations and licensing discussions. So the rights expression language that Dr. Stefik invented was called digital property rights language. It was based on LISP as befits his background in AI. And what Xerox did was it commercialized this system, a DRM system using uh, the DPRL language and they called it Content Guard. So, Content Guard over the years in the 1990s morphed into something called XRML, the Extensible Rights Markup Language. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but basically in the late 90s, 97, 98, XML came into being. And that, of course, is the very, very widely used language or meta language for expressing uh, structured data and structured content. It's been, been used in, in a million different applications. And so Xerox and uh, Stefik recast DPRL as an XML-based language. And then they spun out um, Content Guard into a separate company called Content Guard to market this DRM system. Microsoft became a part owner of the company, as did the media company Time Warner, which is why I call this rights language the establishment rights language. It was uh, owned and controlled by a large major media company, a major technology company, and also a French technology company called Thompson. And essentially, and then they presented it XRML to MPEG to try and make it into an official standard. MPEG did adopt a, a slightly modified version of XRML as something called MPEG-REL, 
And then pretty much nothing happened. <laughs> Nobody really used MPEG rel for anything. Microsoft did use XRML, not the MPEG variant of it, but XRML in its software licensing scheme. So for example, Windows, Office, other Microsoft products use XRML for uh, managing licenses to that product that they grant to PC uh, users. So that's that was the first sort of major commercial rights expression language. And then I'm showing here some example code, which basically is the code for, you can pay $15 to uh, read an ebook and to print it. And I'm not gonna go into this in detail. If you're you know, conversant on an XML code level, you can go look at this code. Then there is what I call the Indie rights expression language, which is ODRL, the Open Digital Rights Language, which was created a few years after XRML by a guy named Renato Ianella in Australia. He worked for a systems integration firm called IPR Systems, and he did this um, along with a, uh, a woman named Susanna Gut in Vienna, Austria, as opposed to Australia. She was a, a business professor at a university there. Uh, with a tech background, very conversant in this stuff. They developed this thing and they did it independently of any company or standards body. So they, they kind of had no particular institutional affiliation, but they did socialize this in various places. And the main place where they got some adoption was in the mobile telephony industry, particularly in Europe. There was a standards body called the Open Mobile Alliance which had a whole family of mobile uh, telephony standards, and they were helping to develop standards for mobile digital content services, such as digital music services. And they adopted a small subset of ODRL for the OMA digital rights management standard. And that engendered a whole bunch of implementations in the mid 2000s in Europe, got a lot of momentum going. But over here on this side of the pond in the US, people were skittish about all the patents that were out there that um, might cause some issues on, on patent licensing. And so there was a reluctance to embrace this technology, not just the Xerox patents, but others as well. And not much happened with this technology in the US and eventually um, the whole scene kind of went quiet and ODRL went into a state of dormancy for a while but hold that thought because we'll get back to that later. So this is just some information about what ODRL looks like conceptually. It specifies these permissions, which include usage permissions or rights, if you will, display, print, play, execute, um, reuse permissions, the re uh, right to modify, to excerpt, annotate, aggregate. These are your derivative work type permissions. Then transfer permissions, which are like your distribution rights. They map to distribution rights and copyright law, sell, lend, give, or lease. And then there are rights that have to do also with distribution, such as move uh, and also reproduction, take a backup, make a duplicate and so on. So these map fairly well to core concepts of copyright law. And I'll just also mention a couple other enforcement oriented rights expression languages that were around and in one case continue to be around. Real Networks had one. You may remember Real Networks. They were the streaming media pioneer of the late 90s through uh, 2000s. Microsoft sort of came in and, see, and uh, proceeded to dominate that market, but Real Networks had a whole ecosystem around its streaming media technology, including a DRM system for which they had a, a rights expression language. Adobe had an ebook ecosystem, which they acquired from a startup called Glassbook in 2000. And that came with a RHEL called EBX, which uh, Adobe subsequently uh, integrated into its own ebook offering. And the Adobe ebook platform is still widely used around the world. In the United States, it's most notably used by the Barnes and Noble Nook system and in um, a system called Overdrive, which is very widely used in public libraries and also school libraries. If you quote, borrow, unquote, an ebook from a library, then you're probably using the Overdrive system, which is based on that Adobe technology. So 
Now we're going to switch to the other main purpose for rights expression languages, which is license automation. And that's, again, simply machine readable license terms to use in a license automation scheme, typically between businesses, not from businesses to consumers, but B2B. And if there's any enforcement of this scheme, it's done through the traditional legal means of, you know, hey, you're, you're in breach of our contract, our license agreement. And then there's a discussion or a lawsuit, what have you, but there is no enforcement angle to the technology around license automation RELs. The origin, at least what I consider to be the origin of this work, was a paper written in 1993 by a Villanova Law School professor named Henry Perrett, who got both undergrad engineering and Sloan MBA degrees from the home team, MIT. Uh, and he wrote a paper called Permission Headers and Contract Law, which was presented at a conference that I consider the seminal conference of digital rights management, which took place at Harvard uh, in 1993. And in the footnote of this slide, you can see that where you can still to this day get the proceedings, which make for very interesting historic reading if you're into that kind of thing. And what Parrott essentially said was, you can have contracts, they can have machine readable headers, machines can read them and act on them in certain ways and here are the legal implications of doing that and the benefits of doing that a very very influential piece of work the first standard to take this approach was something called ice the information content exchange and this came out during the first dot-com internet bubble when there was kind of a fad for something called content syndication which was this idea that Let's say you're, you're Condé Nast or um, uh, Hearst, you're a magazine publisher, and you want to send articles and photographs out into the world that people can buy for 50 cents a piece or what have you. And this can all be you know, sliced and diced up into individual content items, and the whole process can be automated. Interesting idea. It never really took off commercially, and the ICE standard was an attempt to you know, create a standard to automate the licensing. RSS came along much, much simpler than the very complicated and Baroque ICE or ICE standard. RSS, of course, is very, very widely used today. ICE kind of uh, faded after a few years. So in order to talk about where we are nowadays with these license automation languages, we first need to talk a little bit about Creative Commons. And again, some of you may be familiar with this already, and in which case I apologize in advance. Um, but Creative Commons is very important, and um, there's also an MIT angle to it. So Larry Lessig is famous for, among other things, being the founder of Creative Commons, but the uh, famous computer science professor Hal Abelson at MIT also had a big role in that, and, and you'll, his name will pop up again shortly. The basic idea of Creative Commons is that uh, it's based on a, a, a point of view that copyright has gone too far and is too lengthy in duration and gives copyright, uh, or, or rather uh, create creators of copyrighted works, too much rights and not enough rights for the public. So therefore, we need to rebalance things a little bit and create a system whereby um, the public gets more rights and the incentives for copyright, uh, for, for creative people to create uh, copyrighted works are more in line with reality, et cetera, et cetera. That's the basic idea behind Creative Commons. And they have a motto, a motto, some rights reserved, as opposed to all rights reserved, some rights reserved. And as a practical matter, what Creative Commons does is it provides a set of licenses that in which the licensee gets more rights than the licensee would under the copyright bundle, which we discussed a few minutes ago. And it's also important to bear in mind that although Creative Commons can apply to any type of copyrighted work, it can apply to something physical as well as something digital, it's based on an assumption that the copyright bundle applies to piles of bits, which as I said, by themselves do not um, are not covered under copyright. A pile of bits independent of a storage medium is not covered under copyright. It's covered under a license agreement. And Creative Commons is a set of license agreements. So that's all okay. But it's just important to bear that kind of 
fundamental assumption in mind about Creative Commons. Creative Commons is a set of licenses that are expressed as machine readable code, as well as the legal text of the licenses. And you choose from a set of licenses to assign to your work by choosing among options or attributes for things like, are you gonna require the licensee to attribute your work to you, the author, uh, properly? Are you going to allow them to reuse your work for commercial purposes or are you gonna forbid that? Are you gonna allow them to create derivative works from your work or are you gonna require them to uh, copy your work on an as is kind of basis? Very interesting system, very widely used. So what Hal Abelson, told you we'd get back to him, uh, did about 10 years ago was to create a more formal rights expression language for expressing Creative Commons licenses. Creative Commons licenses had been expressed and indeed are still expressed to this day as comments in HTML if you're dealing with an HTML page. And what he wanted to do was to make the license terms sort of more integrated with the content instead of being relegated to comments. And so he created a set of, of, uh, of terms that could be used as a rights expression language that are directly expressible in RDF uh, in XML content. And the RDF is simply a way of expressing metadata or semantics in XML. Um, and also can be expressed using this scheme called Adobe XMP, which is a scheme that Adobe uses for expressing metadata in multimedia files, such as photographs, illustrations, video, and so on. And again, the idea here is just to integrate rights expressions with the content more directly, eliminate redundancy. That's the dry principle, don't repeat yourself. And it is not, not, not at all meant to turn Creative Commons into a DRM scheme. That is absolutely not the intent here. Um, in my view, not enough attention has been paid to CC REL. It's a very interesting idea. Um, I don't see it being used that much. I think maybe it's being used somewhere, but it's certainly worth talking about. It's a nice piece of work. And I have some example code here. This is a Creative Commons license for a photograph. It's in two pages and it requires, and the license here, you can see, um, where is it in the next page? Near the top, you can see that the license is the by nc nd license, which is the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivative Works license. That's the license that this photographer has chosen for his work. And he wants you to, if you're going to use this content, to attribute the photograph to Scott Beale slash, slash Laughing Squid. And there's a URL that he wants you to stick in there so that Someone who sees this can click on it and then view more information about Laughing Squid, which presumably is his company. So that's just some example CC REL code that you can look at. ODRL has also returned from dormancy as a license automation language, and it was uh, morphed into a major a revision called ODRL 2.x. And in 2011, uh, Renato Ianella and others submitted ODRL to the World Wide Web Consortium to attempt to make it an official standard, which, as I mentioned, had not been done uh, as yet, at least not successfully. So uh, roughly a year ago, the World Wide Web Consortium did advance uh, ODRL to recommendation, which is their official standard stage. So now ODRL is, in fact, an official web standard. It is a syntax independent uh, rights language that is expressible in various XML RDF syntaxes. There, there are a number of, there's a few of those that are popular. And it's also expressible in JSON, which is my preference. It's cleaner, it's easier to read, um, more widely used on the web and so on. And um, they're very adamant in assuring everyone that this is not DRM, this has nothing to do with DRM schemes. And one of the reasons why they are adamant about ensuring people of that is they want to make sure that this doesn't come into the realm of the patents that, um, that I explained uh, previously, the Xerox patents and so on. So um, the, the language is really based on this core concept of permissions and obligations or duties. And in fact, the original working group within the W3C 
was called the Permissions and Obligations Expressions, or PO, Working Group. And the primary uh, application of this language is in the news industry with something called Rights ML. And Rights ML is a standard of IPTC, the International Press Telecommunications Council, which is a standards body of the news industry. And the Associated Press um, is using this today for their rights language, a rights license automation. And in the footnotes, you'll see a reference to a slide share presentation done by Stuart Miles from the Associated Press, which is which really worth a look as an excellent explanation of the practical application of rights expression languages for license automation. They're really doing this. They're really, you know, walking the walk over at the Associated Press, which, as you may know, is the largest uh, news gathering organization in the world. So this is a diagram taken from uh, the ODRL uh, website that shows you the kind of data model that's used in the ODRL world with the latest version 2.2, which is a very recent version. And it's based again on uh, permissions and duties. You see that on the right side. Um, and then on the left side, you see assets. Those are the media objects, parties. Those are the licensees, licensors. And then various constraints on the um, on what the uh, licensee can do with it, and so on. And so, I'm providing here a couple of ODRL 2.1 examples that are taken from. Again, uh, this is actually the GitHub repository of, for ODRL. These are expressed in JSON. And this first sample says, "Here's a movie. You can only play it in Germany after 2018." And if you look uh, here, you see there's a, a URL for the movie under target. And then you'll see there is a, um, a date, a, a spatial constraint. For, well, first there's a date and time constraint. It's gotta be after January 1st, 2001. And it's, uh, there's a spatial constraint, which means it has to be within Germany. Another example is, here's a movie, you, you can only distribute it over mobile networks as opposed to, let's say, home broadband or satellite or, or what have you. And here you have a, um, a distribution right with delivery channel must equal mobile, essentially. And again, this is a JSON version of this example. You can look at the code. Pretty easy to read, pretty straightforward. Here's another example specifically from RightsML, which again is what they call a profile of ODRL, like a special case of it or a subset of it. This is expressed simply as a data structure in kind of pseudocode, which makes it even easier to read. You have uh, a picture that can be displayed uh, by a licensee within Germany, and it's being distributed by the EPA, which is the European Publishing Association or the European Press Association. And so you have permissions, the assigner is the EPA, the assignee is EPA partners, the constraint is spatial, and it must equal a DEU, which is the code for Deutschland or Germany. And here is the same code written in JSON. You can also do it in various RDF uh, syntaxes. And again, this is real, this is used in production today through the AP and possibly others. There are a few other license automation rights languages that are worth mentioning, uh, and they tend to be specific to particular niches within the media industry. In the stock image industry, commercial image licensing, photo licensing industry, there is something called PLUS, which stands for Picture Licensing Universal System. It's one of these reverse engineered acronyms. And a guy named Jeff Sedlick uh, runs this initiative, and it's meant for various flavors of image licensing, very specific to that space. Then there is something in the nominally magazine, consumer magazine publishing community, um, underneath the umbrella of a standard family called PRISM, which again, a reverse engineered acronym, I think it stands for Publishers Requirements for Industry Standard Metadata. And they have a rights language for that type of content. In the government and academic library community, so Library of Congress, university libraries, and so on, there is something called METS rights, which if you're from that community, you'd be familiar with the MARC standard. It's a related standard. If you're sending digital materials from one library to another, here are the rights 
that you have with these materials. And then the other one that I'm aware of that's interesting is actually, I think the most recent one, Onyx PL. Onyx is a set of uh, metadata for books, and that includes physical books. It covers things like, uh, it was originally uh, created in the late 1990s to deal with online physical book retailers like Amazon. And it deals with things like, here's how big the book is, here's how many fit in a box, here's how many pages long it is, and, and so on. Uh, and so Onyx PL is the permissions language for Onyx. And those are all uh, languages that are in use for uh, license automation. So that kind of covers rights expression languages for license automation. I want to take a step back now before I go into uh, music and the Music Modernization Act example and just talk about, provide a little context, provide a little big picture here and talk about how these things interrelate, rights expression languages, DRMs, licenses, and copyright. And how do these all fit together? And in a way, what we're really talking about is Lessig's four factors. We've got code, we've got technology, we've got laws, and we've got behaviors. How do these things interrelate? Uh, how do rights expression languages cause these things to interrelate? So licenses, what are they? They're legally enforced rights and restrictions in a contract. DRM, that is a set of technologically enforced rights and restrictions on content. Independently of whatever legal terms may apply, DRM is technology. RELs can be used in either paradigm to enable precision in a DRM system or in a uh, pure contract uh, license system. RELs can encode licenses that confer more rights than the copyright bundle on the licensee. That's the basic idea of Creative Commons, to give the licensee more rights than the licensee would get under copyright law. They can also be used to, uh, to describe licenses that confer more restrictive rights or less rights than the copyright bundle. And if you're looking at the end user license agreements for many commercial content services like Amazon or Apple or Barnes and Noble or, or what have you, it's gonna be true of those agreements. They will be more restrictive with regard to digital content. You can't resell it, you can't lend it, um, you can't publicly, well, you can't do that anyway, so never mind that, it's more restrictive. The relevant point of law here is, again, that you don't get the copyright bundle with pure digital content. Pure digital content is something that is covered only under license agreements, and this was just reaffirmed by the Second Circuit in a court decision that just came down within the last few weeks uh, in a case called Capital Records versus Redigi. Very interesting case. Redigi is a Boston, they still exist, Boston area startup. In fact, uh, in Boston, uh, across the river from MIT. And their basic business model is you buy songs on iTunes, you can resell them as quote, used unquote, through their platform. They were sued and the court found that what they were doing was a violation of copyright law. They are still in business because they have a new architecture which they think might pass muster with the law, but that has remains to be seen. Um, and so the Second Circuit kind of reaffirmed this idea that you've got to tie content to a physical medium in, in order for copyright to apply. And the judge said something like, and again, Mr. Pierre Laval, Judge Pierre Laval, who we mentioned earlier, having written that seminal Harvard Law Review article, he said, you know, you, you could apply a copyright to a set of music tracks that are on a thumb drive, for example, then the whole thumb drive full of music would be something that's covered under copyright, but the songs just floating around cyberspace are not. Relevant point of technology that's worth mentioning. Rights expression languages enable precision and certainty, but they do not enable DRMs to be capable of emulating copyright rights. So many people like to say DRM is about restrictions to rights that you would get under copyright. What I like to, what I prefer to say is that they are simply not capable of emulating copyright. It's apples and oranges in a way. And there was actually a very interesting project that took place uh, a decade ago, over a decade ago, the standards initiative called the Digital Media Project that illustrates this. This was started in 2003 by a man named Leonardo Carrione in Italy, 
He is the founder of MPEG, so he knows a thing or two about tech standards. Um, and his idea was to create an open interoperable DRM standard set that respected and emulated real world content usages, including copyright uh, rights. And that uh, worldwide, not just in one country or another. Uh, this still exists, it's kind of on low simmer, but the most interesting, in my opinion, thing that they did was they tried to create this set of mappings of DRM constructs to what they called trues or traditional rights and usages. And in this PowerPoint, there's actually a URL to the web page that shows you the extremely lengthy list of traditional rights and usages that they collected or kind of crowdsourced among their uh, participants. It's incredibly exhaustive, and yet the work was never completed, which just really shows you how this is um, perhaps an impossible task to take on. So now we're going to talk about the Music Modernization Act and we're going to talk about music licensing. But first, I'd like to just establish some basics about music rights. And again, some of you may know this already, in which case I apologize and you can skip maybe if you're viewing a recording of this. But one thing that's most fundamental about music recordings is that they carry two copyrights each. One is for the underlying composition can think of as the sheet music with the lyrics, and then the other is for the sound recording. And if you think of the Beatles yesterday, that was written by John Lennon and Paul McCartney, so that's the composition. And then there have been hundreds and hundreds, of, if not thousands, of covers of that song, and they are sound recordings by whoever covered that song, Beatles or whoever else it was. Today's popular subscription digital music services such as Spotify, Apple Music, Google Play, Tidal, Amazon Music Unlimited, etc. typically offer three types of services that each require a set of licenses from copyright owners in music. Interactive streams, which are you choose the track you want to hear, it plays the track. What we call conditional downloads, which have also been called tethered downloads, which is you download a track to your device and it will play on your device uh, until your subscription is no longer valid. You've canceled it or, or what have you. And that's often used for enabling you to play a song on your device without a, a live internet connection. Such as in, in New York where I live, you're on the subway and you don't have a connection, you wanna hear a song. Then there are permanent downloads, which are DRM-free files that you buy, and they are downloaded to your device, and you have them in perpetuity. Notice I didn't say own. You're licensing them, but you have them. They are on your device. And um, those are the basic three paradigms that today's big uh, services offer. And in order to offer them, these services, which we call DSPs, digital service providers, it's a music industry term, they have to pay a set of royalties depending on what type of service they're offering. And there are a number of these, but here's some, here are the most common examples, and these are typical cases. There are exceptions, there are a lot of nooks and crannies to this, but these are the typical examples. You have to pay a, uh, a royalty for reproduction and distribution of the sound recording to a record label. You have to pay for reproduction and distribution of the composition to a music publisher. And again, this is like the sheet music with lyrics. And in the music publishing part of the music industry, they refer to this as a mechanical right and a mechanical royalty. You also have to pay for the public performance of a composition to something called a PRO, uh, which is an organization like ASCAP or BMI and so on, or in some cases, you pay it directly to a music publisher if it's one of the big ones like Warner Chapel or Sony ATV. Um, the second one of those, I've underlined it because we're going to talk more about it. There is a compulsory license under copyright law, which means the copyright law guarantees a license of that nature without you having to negotiate with the rights holder in advance. And in the law, the royalties are set. They are set by law. And so that's the compulsory license for mechanicals. Now there are private agreements that supersede that compulsory license, but I'm gonna 
for the purposes of this discussion, pretend they don't exist because it just makes the discussion a lot simpler. So the Music Modernization Act, I know is something that other people in this course are going to talk about. And this is again, probably redundant to what some others like George Howard and Vicki Nauman are gonna talk about. And they're extremely knowledgeable about this stuff. But just to set the stage for what I'm gonna talk about here, I wanna go over the basics of the, Mo the Music Modernization Act, which is a piece of legislation that passed uh, very recently, late last year. Basically what it does rel in, in relevant part is it revises Section 115's uh, compulsory mechanical license in a few key ways. One is that under the, pre, uh, the, the previous or prior uh, compulsory license, you had to take a license to each track individually. That license was guaranteed to you by law, but it required that you did certain things like file paperwork with the license, with the license or, or with the copyright office. This process has proven to be a gigantic pain in the neck for these service providers. It was fine when all you wanted to do was do a cover version of the Beatles yesterday or what have you. Then it was a simple process. You filed some paperwork, you got your license and you were off and running. But if you're Spotify or Apple Music or Google Play, you are acquiring tens of thousands of tracks from record labels and independent music aggregators every day. Each one of those requires some paperwork to be filed, and each one of those has some data about the composition that underlies the sound recording that could be uh, that you're not getting directly from the music publisher or songwriter. So it could be missing, it could be incorrect, it could be even in dispute. So you're taking in all this information. You have to get this in, this um, information about. Um, music compositions that enables you to get a license. You may not know where to get that information. Um, it's a source of trouble and it's led to lawsuits with um, lawsuits against Spotify and Apple. And it's basically a big become a big problem that's reared its ugly head now that services like Spotify, Apple Music and so on have become the dominant source of revenue in the recorded music industry. I'm gonna pause to take a drink of water because I'm about to lose my voice. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Okay, welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, um, what services like Google Play, Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, and so on have been doing is they've been processing all this paperwork by themselves or more commonly hiring a third party service provider such as the Harry Fox Agency or a company called Music Reports to do it for them. Under the Music Modernization Act, all of that is replaced by a single um, licensing agency that is appointed by the US Copyright Office that will process all of these mechanical licenses for all the streaming services that are eligible under certain conditions. So it's, a, it's effectively a de facto monopoly nonprofit agency that will do all this work and the Copyright Office will choose an entity to do this in response to proposals by, I believe it's July of this year. So a lot of big changes uh, will, will happen as a result of this. Um, the music industry in general is very happy that it's passed. I think that it's got pros and cons, but on balance, it's a good thing for the music industry. It'll remove a lot of uncertainty and paperwork. It will also increase royalty payments to songwriters and music publishers. Um, as a result of other aspects of the legislation that I won't go into here. So now let's talk about how this would relate to rights expression languages, now that we understand the fundamentals of mechanical licensing and all that stuff. So what we're talking about here is rights that a publisher, a music publisher, is granting to a digital music service provider, and they are rights that exist because of a blanket statutory license that exists for all tracks you know, all music tracks, period. Um, and one of the things that you can draw on to represent this in a rights expression language is an existing standard in the music industry called DDEX, which stands for Digital Data Exchange. This is a set of messaging uh, primitive, well, messaging constructs in, in, in the language, which can be expressed in 
XML or I believe common delimited ASCII or something of that nature, which include uh, all the information that a record label wants a service provider to know when they have released a recording. So if I am, you know, Universal Music Group and I'm sending a feed to YouTube or to Spotify, I'm going to send information about all these releases that I'm putting out in this format. And one of the pieces of information that I'm going to send, in addition to the basic metadata, artist title, certain standard identifiers, such as an ISRC, which is standard sound recording identifier, is the set of rights that I'm licensing to this service provider. And among them are the three rights that um, are typically provided by these DSPs, on-demand streaming, conditional downloads, and permanent downloads. There are others, and there's DDEX documentation that I believe DAZA has put up on the uh, course website that you can look at. So, um, yes, and one just little bit of context setting, um, if I may, when you say DSPs, to give people a sense of the type of market participant you're uh, referring to, would that be, for example, Spotify or um, Apple Music? Yeah, so DSP is the in, is the music industry jargon term for digital service provider, and what we're talking about here is exactly that: your Spotify's, your Apple Music, your Google Play's, Amazon Music Unlimited, Napster, Tidal, Deezer, um, and and a few others that I can't think of at the moment. Um, but but those are the those are the biggies, and they they all offer this kind of combination of services for end users. Uh, and they're the ones who are specifically targeted for the uh, benefits of the Music Modernization Act. Yep, perfect. So Thanks. I appreciate that uh, kind of context setting. And um, and uh, and I did ask you to to um, talk a bit about this part this part of the uh, marketplace, partly because I think it's something people understand, and because there are some, as you said, like major uh, reforms and, and and changes coming with this new. Uh, legislation, Music Modernization Act, and uh, when we get down into student exercises, we may select other license types, such as the so-called sync license for um, putting music to, like, you know, film or TV. But um, but at a high level, I th I hope this is something everyone can relate to because uh, most people do get their music this way nowadays. Well, I'm sorry fact, to break your stride. I just wanted to provide a little context for what you're saying. No, I, that's excellent context, and in fact. To two comments back at you. First of all, the other reason why it's important to focus on these DSPs is because they have become the majority revenue source for the music industry. Over the last few years, they now represent collectively about two thirds of music industry revenue. It's not about downloads anymore. Downloads are in free fall. Vinyl is a nice little market, but it's not gonna be more than single digit percentage revenue share. Um, CDs, you know, on low simmer nowadays. Radio, it's still there, but it's not that big of a deal. The major, major part of the music industry nowadays is these interactive streaming type services. So that's why it's important to focus on them. And the data problems that they've had were always there, but it's just that no one particularly cared about them until they became the huge businesses with tens of millions of subscribers that they are today. The other comment that I want to make about what you just said, Daza, regarding context is sync licenses are very amenable to implementation in an automated mar online marketplace using rights expression languages. And I haven't talked about them today, but I leave it as an exercise, as they like to say, to, to explore that. And it would be a, a welcome addition to the industry to do so because there have been several attempts over the years to create online automated marketplaces for sync licensing. And by sync licensing, what we mean is the licensing of music for use with things like video content, TV commercials, TV shows, movies, um, video games, th things of that nature. Big business, kind of the wild, wild west in terms of the way it's organized, very amenable to automation for the lower sort of cost transactions, not like negotiating with Taylor Swift to, to make her song a theme song for a Netflix sitcom or, or what have you, but the more everyday uh, tasks of, of music sync licensing, of which there are many, many. 
So with, with all that in mind, I'm going to go back to my slides. Great, thank I'm you. Attempt to thank go Thank you back. for joining me on that little excursion. Back on the road we go. Okay, back on the road we go, and here we go. So talking about representing mechanical licenses in a rights expression language, uh, rights expression language. One issue that you have, so that, first of all, there are two licenses that you can represent. One is the license that the publisher confers on the music service provider. And those again are these three types of things, on-demand streams, permanent downloads, conditional downloads. Then there are the license terms that the DSP confers on users through apps and devices through DRM systems. And yes, for everything but permanent downloads, DRM is still used, certain flavors of DRM. And one thing that's interesting here is that a publisher can issue a conditional download license to a service provider, but just issuing a conditional download license doesn't really tell you anything about the parameters of that conditional download. It doesn't say like, you can play this X number of times, or you can play this until you, the end of the month, at which point you have to pay another month subscription, things like that. So there's a bit of a disconnect there, which, puts kind of a crimp in the in the automatability of this, so to speak. But it's just something to look at if you're looking to automate this through a rights language. So with that in mind, what I have offered is an exercise to represent these mechanical rights that the MMA, Music Modernization Act, touches in a rights expression language. And the simplest exercise is number one here, just to take these mechanical rights and represent them as a data structure in the style of the RightsML data structure that I showed a few slides back, just as a, as a pseudocode data structure. Then the second one, the extra credit one, is to represent it as uh, an ODRL profile in JSON or RDF. And then the extra extra credit one would be to expand that beyond the mechanical license to all of the relevant rights for interactive music DSPs and to do that as an ODRL profile. In other words, RightsML took ODRL and made a profile of it for the news business, which mainly has to do with photos and text articles. They're working on expanding it to video and other types of news, but right now it really is applied to photos and text. And if someone were to take um, take that example and create an analogous uh, set of, of, uh, of rights expression language constructs for music licensing to digital music services, that would really move the needle of the music industry and could be very useful as things like the Open Music Initiative, which George Howard uh, talks about in this class, move forward with their automation on blockchain. So that kind of ties it all together. And if someone were to create this ODRL profile for the music industry for these DSPs usages, or even for sync rights, that would really be a contribution to the industry. And I, as far as I know, and I have looked, nobody else is doing this right now. So with that, this is all my contact info. I'm happy to talk to anyone. And I look forward, and you can always look this up later, I look forward to meeting every participant when I come up to Cambridge uh, next week for the class. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Bill. That was um, exactly what I had hoped you would say and the information I hoped you would provide. And it was so clear as well. And um, so we'll post your uh, a PDF and a PowerPoint version of your slides um, in the presentation. Actually, I think we already have it on GitHub, but we'll link it to um, to your session page so that people can get those very important links that you provided um, down to the source material, as especially perhaps including the um, ODRL specifications. And um, I think yesterday when we were prepping for your session, uh, we, we identified a few more helpful links to examples, uh, developer page. Like the DDEX document and, and a few other odds and ends, yes. Yeah, a few other odds and ends, some example uh, license types or, um, uh, kind of um, pseudocode squibs uh, from ODRL, which I thought were helpful, and yeah. maybe even some leads on some parsers or you know some uh, some processors. Yeah. Still so working on that. Play with it. If if I have more to add, I will certainly add it. Um, still working on that. Great. Um, 
Okay, then. Um, so then we look forward to hosting you uh, at MIT on Tuesday. And um, and we should have, um, a, it's an online session as a reminder, but we should be able to actually see the almost like Brady Bunch style, all the, all the people joining on. And, uh, and we'll be continuing to collect pigeonhole um, feedback uh, for questions and ideas and other comments on your remarks in the lead up between now and your session so that we can really get off to a, a sprinting start. Super. Okay. Thanks again. And we'll Thank see you soon.